Hello, Facebook friends. Hey, everybody. Thanks Welcome for joining to Bird us Talk. today. Yeah. It's nice to see you. Yeah. We're going to triple down on you today. Yes, indeed. Instead of doubling down. Three dogs. Who let the dogs out? That's kind of a rhetorical question, isn't it? And of course, music and money is that a radio day, term, Three Dogs? Uh, sing, just sing a, night. a dog night. Yeah. We have a uh, client uh, on the Amazon side that's called Three Dog Bakery. I wonder oh, yeah, if that's yeah. the uh, etymology of I wonder. I should ask the owner how that name came to be. He probably just has three dogs. The following program is paid for by Wild Birds Unlimited. KNUS and its staff are not responsible for any of the views, opinions, fabrications, postulations, or outright falsehoods you may hear in the upcoming program. Nor is the station management, its parent company, stockholders, or their families. Nor are the parents, siblings, spouses, children, relatives, friends, or enemies of David and Scott Meadow. Well, maybe their enemies are responsible. Yeah, that's it. Anything they say that you don't like, you can blame on their enemies, whose names they will reveal on this show or one like this one sometime in the future. If there are any future shows, that is. They don't really have any enemies at this time, but they're planning to alienate enough people through the course of the next hour or so that they'll have enough enemies so that you'll have no trouble finding one to blame their indiscretions on. So to them. Sheesh. All right, Mike is hot. Welcome to Bird Talk, your weekly fine feathered feature that helps you get more birds more often for more fun. Now, here are your avian amigos, David and Scott Minow on News Talk 710, KNUS. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to Bird Talk. Thank you. You are listening to the Bird Talk guys. Scott, David, and Dean. Yeah. On 710 KNUS 990 KRKS. Bird like, Talk is presented by Wild Birds Unlimited stores yeah. in Arvada, Denver, and Highlands Ranch, alphabetically speaking. Yeah, and uh, we're like the three musketeers today. Oh, yes. Kind of cool. D'Artagnan. Yeah. Where are the other two? Uh, you had Athos, Porthos, and D'Artagnan. No, uh, Tanya was the fourth. The fourth. So it was Athos, Porthos, and uh, uh, Curly. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We didn't but, have uh, Shemp. But, yeah, we have Dean with us today, Dean Seifert. Uh, congratulations, Dean. Thank uh, you, Dean sir. just it. bought the Arvada store from yours truly. Dean and Tina are the new owners of the Arvada store, and I couldn't be more excited about that to have uh, these wonderful people. Taking over the Arvada store. Well, I appreciate it, and thanks for letting. Uh, thanks for adopting me here on the Bird Talk that, Show today. I that's it. Yeah, yeah. I'm the just. If you guys are on Facebook, I'm the younger, more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're obviously not. But uh, you should have worn a hat. <laughs> you have to be bold well, to be on this show. That's right? it, that's it exactly. I, I have a head for radio. For sure. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So, so uh, today is the month uh, of October. So, it what is. happened in history? Well, back in 331 BC, which yeah. was a long, it was long time ago. Alexander the Great defeats Darius the Third of Persia in the Battle of Gagamela. Darius, that was the third musketeer. No, that, oh, okay. that was the uh, guy from Hootie and the Blowfish. What else happened? Uh, 1721, the first African camel is imported into the U.S. Yeah. He was 7 feet tall, 12 feet long. And then it was in not until 1856 when they started importation of cam camels for military purposes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were using them for targets or Desert what. Desert, Southwest, yeah. Yeah, 1890. On this date, Yosemite National Park is created in California. Oh, happy birthday, That took park. a lot of building. They had to build El Capitan and do all that stuff. Oh, that's right. Have all the rides and everything. And yeah. The, uh, yeah. Uh, 1907, uh, motor car speed traps were being protested in London in 1907 by Lord Montague. He said that the police neglect their regular duties just for the sport of speed trapping. Yes. Apparently his son got a ticket. And he <laughs> That's got to be that. it. Uh, 1908, the next year, the first Model T Ford was unveiled to the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, it cost $825. 
as the production volume went up, they were able to reduce the price to $525, and they were making a two-door runabout at the same time for $260, which reminds me of how much I paid for my daughter's first car. Oh, my. And yeah, then... Uh, didn't it, have any brakes. It but, came in uh, any color... As long as it was black. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 1949, the first rectangular TV tube was produced, the first CRT tube oh. that was rectangular. I was kind of hoping for hexagonal. They came out with rectangular yeah. back in 1949. 1950, the Peanuts comic strip debuts ah. on this day in 1950. I understand little Abner had peanuts envy at that time because <laughs> he was a little bit put out that there was competition. Snoopy didn't appear until the third strip. Oh. And then he was and he was kind of the best part. He was know. just a puppy. Yeah. Uh, 1956, the Atomicron is developed. I think it was one of the Transformers, wasn't it? Uh, no, no, no. No, it's a clock. It was the atomic clock, yeah. the U.S. atomic clock. Right. And the basis of the timing... Is, was the frequency of the oscillations of cesium, the cesium atom. Right. And that oscillated at 9,132,631,830 megahertz. Good job. And you could own one of these for a mere $50,000 back then. Yeah. I bet it would be a lot more now. And no, no, that's, that's computer stuff gets cheaper with time. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1959. The Twilight Zone debuts mm. on this day. Do, 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 Apparently, it was the fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It's the middle of the ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of a man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. That's very good. You did all that it's without an area a cigarette in which your hand. We call <laughs> the Twilight Zone. Yes. Uh, 1970, Janis Joplin finishes recording her only number one hit, which was Me and Bobby McGee, written mm -hmm. by Chris Christopherson. She died three days later, so she didn't know it was a number one hit, and it was one of only two number one hits that made number one posthumously. What was the other one? It was Otis Redding. Sitting, oh, sit sitting on, on the, the dock, dock of the, the bay. bay. That's exactly right, oh. yeah. And then birthdays today. Yeah. We have, uh, Groucho Marx. Oh. Julius Marx was born on this day in 1890. His, one of his famous quotes was, Outside of a dog, a man's best friend is a book. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> uh, Sting was born on this day in 1951. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, was born on this day in 1869. And in 1492, King Richard III was born, who was assassinated by Henry Tudor when his nobleman, deserted him. Right. And I I imagine all those are listeners of Bird Talk. And then two days from now, what? Kathy Menno was born. And That's I won't say true. the year, just out of respect. He Smart move. Yeah. Probably can't remember and, and it anymore And self-preservation, yes. too. Yeah. 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 See, yeah. But, but you've got a gift picked out already, so you're good. You're out of the game. Yeah. Oh, you got to do gifts for birthdays, don't you? Yeah, well... Uh, well, it's early. You know, if anybody wants to join us in this, 303-696-1971 uh, is the number. And uh, Dean and Tina, and I mean, they brought their whole family in yes. on this Wild Birds Unlimited business. And after 30-plus uh, years of business, David and I have retired before we do damage to the stores. Yeah. And um, we really appreciate all the customers that we've met over the years that have made our stores the best stores in the country. And now Dean and Tina own them. And we welcome you to join us. Yeah. You can uh, join us on Facebook. We're using the Denver Facebook uh, page today. And if you have any questions for Dean and uh, or Scott and me, uh, please join us and uh, submit your questions on Facebook, or you can call us. We actually have a phone number. You can use the miracle of telephony to give yeah. us a call at 303-696-1971. That's a number to call. We'd love to hear what's going on in your wildlife habitat. Do you see any new birds that you haven't seen before? Would you like to see birds you have not yet seen? We can help you with that, too. Not so, only that, but uh, a bonus... Nikki says we sound good on Facebook this week. All right. Sometimes that's a challenge. Thanks, Nikki. Good deal. We also sound good on podcasts after the show at birdtalkguys.com. 303-696-1971. We'll be back after the break. 
You're clear. Bird is a black cap chickadee. We got Ann on the line. Okay. What does Ann want to know? I attract them with my wild birds and limits. Who the third musketeer is. Oh, okay. I did have that too, by the way. Athos, Porthos, and uh, Aramis. 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 And D'Artagnan was the wannabe. Yeah. He was the kid, right? Yeah, he was the young guy. Yeah. Yeah. His name was longer, though. Yeah. They shouldn't have let him join. Do you guys remember the author? Sure. This this book came up in, uh, what movie was that with Leonardo DiCaprio? Dumas Pere. Yeah, was a French guy, but... Um, Alexander like Dumas. The slave, yeah, Alexander Dumas. How about the next one? Uh, Twelve Years a Slave. Is that it? I don't think I saw that. It was with uh, Jamie Foxx and yeah, Leonardo it was. DiCaprio. I didn't oh, know. Oh, no. yeah. yeah. And in, in no, the, that wasn't 12 Years a Slave. No, it, was, it had to do with slavery, though, and I can't yeah, remember it what it was. Django. Django. Django and yes. Jane. There you go. That's it. He with plays the, the trivia guy. Gracias. Yes. I appreciate you didn't have to look that one up. Really? I just watched it on an airplane like three weeks ago. I should remember it. It was a good show. I might have had a couple shooters by the time I watched it. <laughs> Anyway, it came up because the it was in the slave owner's home in his library. Oh, yeah. And the gentleman that was standing there talking to him said it was it was because earlier that morning the slave owner had had dogs sick on one of his slaves. And so this guy's character said, I don't think that Alexander Dumont would have appreciated what happened this morning. And the slave owner said, why? He goes, because he was black. Right. He was a black Frenchman, which probably not so well known at the time. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Huh. I thought he was French all this time. Yeah. yeah and, and oddly enough, you can be both. No. Yes. You're kidding. It does happen. Mike is hot now. Welcome back to Bird Talk. If you'd like to join us, the number is 303-696-1971. And is it Ann that we have on the phone? Yes. Hello, Ann. Hey, happy October, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And to you. Oh, it's Ann Thank Price. You. Okay. Yes, it is. It's October 1st. Now we know Hello, who you Ann. are. Yeah. Hi, Let Ann. It, let's check the calendar. Apparently, <laughs> retirement agrees with you, Dave. You know, we have so much good stuff going on these days. We almost forgot about the best thing, and that is having Ann, Ann Price, Price with, with the us. Raster Education Foundation here. And today we're going to talk about... The long-eared owl. That's Ooh, right. You got that right, right and Very good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a really lovely species of owl that's actually quite common here in Colorado, but you need to know where to look for them. And um, they look kind of like a miniature great horned owl. Their plumage can be very similar, but they are actually found um, all over temperate yes latitudes around the world. Um, they breed as far north as central Canada, northern Russia, Scandinavia, and um, in Colorado, what I tell folks to do is if you want to find a long-eared owl, winter is best, and they will roost or sleep together in shelter belts and juniper tree rose, especially uh -huh. out east. Now, this one is most commonly confused with a great horned owl. Isn't it, it? It's like a slim great horned owl with longer ear tufts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, much longer, more centrally placed, a couple of different colors. And then um, at least our birds in North America look like they are wearing a white X. So they have um, white eyebrows, so to speak, oh, yeah. that meet at the beak, and then they have white, um, almost like a mustache, the bristles that are right up against the beak and go down towards the throat. Cool. Very cool. And what do yeah. they like to eat? Um, it, you know, they have a huge diet, depending on where in the world they live. Don't but we most all? most of them eat, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most of them eat mostly mammals, voles, uh -huh. mice. Um, oddly enough, most species don't tend to eat a lot of um, amphibians, but reptiles um, in more southern latitudes, uh, big insects, big bugs. Um, yeah, there's also, um, I think they go all the way out to some of the um, 
um, close to portions of northern India. So anything they can catch, because, I mean, they're, they're little. Interestingly enough, they don't tend to follow um, the Bergman's rule, which is, you know, northern latitude critters are larger. Uh-huh. Right. Um, yeah, so like in Alaska, of course, their ravens, their wolves, their bears are larger, you know, than ours. Yes, um, volume to surface in, area, yeah. Exactly, helps them stay warm, all that, you know, nonsense. But, um, yeah, you know, a male in Colorado can be eight, nine, nine and a half ounces, a female, 11 to 12. Oh, my. And they're a little different in their nesting habitats as well, aren't they? Whereas many owls are very solitary. Yeah, um, they don't tend to be as close together when they are nesting, um, but certainly during the winter and at night sleeping. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, I think someone somewhere uh, found 150 owls roosting together at some point. Yes. Um, They do like safety in numbers. Um, They're monogamous, and the populations that don't migrate and go to a southern, slightly warmer winter range, the pairs stay, stay together throughout the year. Well, that would help those birds stay warmer in northern climates if they're that close together. Yeah, and safety in numbers. They don't want to be seen. They stand up very tall. They they get skinny. And the very long uh, ear tufts, some scientists think that serves to break up the round, very obvious owl facial, facial silhouette. Um, if you are a mouse or something crawling around trying to forage, um, that those ear tufts help you hide up against a tree trunk. Hey, Ann, this is Dean Seifert. Uh, we actually had a great hi, hor- Dean. hi. We had a great horned owl in the Denver store at the live uh, Birds of Prey uh, session a week ago. That's right. Um, and I'm, a lot of the questions that came in were about how owls hear because people think that the tufts on the top of their head are ears sometimes. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between long, long uh, horned owls and great horned owls' ears? Are they about the same? And how do they um, work? Well, long eared owls do have the more deeply nocturnal asymmetric ear placement, whereas great horned owls have a symmetrical ear placement. The ears are behind the facial, facial disc in a great horned owl, and they are level, just like yours and mine. But many deeply nocturnal owls, like long-eared owls, have the left ear higher than the right. It allows sound waves to hit a split second apart and helps the owl triangulate and detect where the sound, in most cases, prey um, is coming from. That's the external auditory meati, David. Yeah, I have uh, been accused of having uh, unequal ears, too. Uh, One of mine's a little higher than the other one. Now, they have a beautiful call, and it sounds kind of like this. Or exactly. So it's quite different than a great horn, which is kind of a three-note call. And then they have their, uh, their alarm call, which isn't quite as pretty as that. That would wake me up in the morning on my alarm. Yeah. That's interesting, guys. The alarm call sounds very much like their close relative, the short-eared owl. Yeah. Short-eared owls are like the ground-dwelling version of the long-eared owls. They're in the same genus, Osio. They are almost the same size. They like to roost communally, but um, short-eared owls will make high-pitched squeaking or barking noises. They almost sound like poodles Hmm. to communicate. Uh, with each other, and the long-eared alarm call that you just played sounds a little bit like the noise our short-eared owl makes. Very cool. Yeah, that's something. Yeah. Now, I ha- I saw one down at Chatfield when it was nesting down there, and at that time I was uh, 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 managing the rare bird alert when it was back on uh, tape, and this was uh, a uh, answering machine with little cassette tapes, which are little square okay. boxes about that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Two reels. Oh, I anyway. remember those. Yeah, 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 remember those. Anyway, and uh, so after a while, we decided not to put the location of it on there, 
and that we found that uh, when birders went down to look at this owl, fishermen would come over and look at it too, but they'd get too close. And there was a concern that it would disturb the nesting owl and cause it to abandon the nest. So it, it, interesting how human versus uh, wildlife can affect. I think that is a huge issue with nesting raptors in particular because they're they're large, they're kind of charismatic and easy to find. Um, their nests are going to be more conspicuous than say a yellow rumped warblers, you know, buried in a leafy tree, for instance. And um, especially with a nocturnal species that is reliant upon daytime to brood young and sleep and keep the proper feeding cycle, you know, when it needs to be. You don't want to flush an owl from a nest during the daytime. No. You just no. Don't. Or any time. And no. the other interesting thing I'm seeing about these guys is, um, because obviously I focused on our, our western, um, you know, North American uh, long-eared owls, um, some of the birds found in Eurasia have more orange, darker irises. And they look like shrunken versions of the Eurasian eagle owl, which is basically the largest, or tied to be the largest owl in the world. And part of me, guys, is wondering this morning if there is not some evolutionary advantage to having a North American long-eared owl look like a small great horned owl to, because no wild animal is going to intentionally mess with a great horn. Right, and right. The, you know, the guys in the Netherlands and Russia have done the same to look like the great Eurasian eagle owl, which is one of the few owls in the world with a deep, bright orange, you know, eye color. So it could be evolutionary mimicry, mimicry going yeah. on. Not like the unknown. monarch and the viceroy. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. or the yeah. painted, painted lady. ladies. Yeah, that yeah. too. Now, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the best way to find them is in the winter, and you mentioned how to... Are, are they migratory in our area? Um, monogamous pairs may not leave. Uh, if I think in southern Colorado, where it's a little bit warmer in the winter, um, but I suspect that um, most of our um, long-eared owls in Colorado migrate on an elevation basis, like goshawks. Okay. So they love those conifers and those pines, uh, not super high, but for a a you know a, a safe place to nest. And then they need to get out into meadows and more open areas to feed during the winter when they are not raising young. Um, and it seemed like every time I've ever seen a long-eared owl, I've been out on our wonderful eastern Colorado plains uh, flying my falcon hunting, and I have flushed an owl from a tree row, those rows of junipers, you know, things like that, that provide such important habitat for pheasants and barn owls and jackrabbits and our prairie species, things cool. like that. Well, tell us... What is the best way for people to find out more about uh, these beautiful birds of prey and, of course, the Raptor Education Foundation in general? Uh, I'm going to send everybody right to our website today because that leads us into our next exciting thing that we're doing next month. Excellent. So our website, raptoreducationfoundation.org, U-S-A-R-E-F.org, and right on the homepage beneath a yellow donate donate button, we are doing a raptor identification course oh, cool. next month. Yes, first one in three years, thank Excellent. you, COVID. And we're doing it out at Bar Lake State Park. Our wonderful partner, um, Michelle Subert, the park manager out there, on Saturday, November 12th. Nice. The Wings of Winter. Oh, wings very cool. Wings of Winter. Saturday, yes. November 12th, Wings of Winter at Bar Lake State Park. Yes, from 9.30 to 12.30, and uh, registration is limited to 40 participants. We're about a third up, and we are offering early bird pricing until October 9th. Uh, $50 for REF members, 60 for the general public. So how this works is excellent identification slides, courtesy of Karen Metz, who is a monitor at Castlewood Canyon State Park, and then nine live raptors. 
so you can compare the four beautios and, you know, three falcons, things like that. And we're going to have an eagle, and you'll get to brush up on your incoming winter raptors. Nice. Cool. Well, yeah. thank you. We appreciate you joining us today, Anne. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, and we encourage everyone to go to the uh, REF website and find out more about that. We're right on the homepage. Yep, the best ID class in Colorado. Thank you, guys. All right. Happy October. Happy fall. Thanks, thank Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thanks a lot. Take care, Dean. Yeah, you too. If you'd like to join us, we're at 303-696-1971. That's the number to join. And uh, On Facebook Live, Maria says she's listening from Texas where the ruby-crowned kinglets have arrived. I love those little birds. Oh, aren't they great? Oh, they are. And sometimes you don't see that little ruby crown unless you're at the right angle or yeah. or they want to show you. Yeah, they're displaying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're 303 We'll take a break here. We'll be back after the break. You're clear. Thank you. Thank you. My Wild favorite Birds color. Unlimited. We specialize in providing good old Ann. Sorry I didn't say price. Oh, that's okay. We kind of <laughs> forgot. <laughs> yeah. It was the first Saturday of the month. Yeah. A little spacey here. These guys yeah. are retired. They're yeah, that's right. Out. We don't have to think we anymore. <laughs> that's why we develop. Y'all are still doing the show, though, right? Yes, indeed. All right. So far, oh, so for at least so another Dean, half an hour. Yeah. So, Dean, you're taking over the show? Well, we're still working through things. We'll figure out what the schedule looks like. All right. Well, you, you seem like you're holding your holding your chops. He's good. You've been, you've been joking around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been known as a as a joke. <laughs> he's kind of a... <laughs> he's, he keeps us all laughing, <laughs> whether he means to or not. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> <laughs> laughing with, laughing at, I don't care as long as I get a laugh. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Better than having people cry at you. As long as there's one chuckle out of ten tries, yeah, that's a good ratio. It counts. <laughs> my wife just coming back. No, never mind. See, all right, that was my bad. Yeah, we got news. We got news. Yeah, that was a quick one. Yeah. Um, there was so much we learned about that great horned owl last week or the week before, whenever it was. There's yeah. Fascinating how they've evolved oh, yeah, uh, yeah. over time. But I thought the great horned owl actually had offset ears as well. <laughs> no, as, the not as barn owl has offset ears, oh, but yeah. not many owls do. Most really? most have uh, fairly symmetrical ears. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I guess the more nocturnal they are. The yeah. ones you can tell without asking them are the ones that are going like this. Yeah. 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 They Could also be. have some interesting ends, I guess, on their, the, their tail feathers, right? That allows it. Kind uh, of wing feathers. All wing feathers. feathers. Yeah. 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 Any flight feathers will have the interesting little curl that makes them absolutely silent yeah. in flight. Yeah. And that's why when you go to a Harry Potter movie and they show all the owls flying in and their wings are flapping and making noise, making noise, you yeah. say that's not right, and your daughters say, "Shut up, Dad. Yeah. We're watching a movie." Right. Right. I had one down at Chatfield I was birding, but I was looking down for snakes rather than up for birds. And Great Horned Owl comes up behind me and whaps me on the back of the head. I didn't hear a thing. And I must have got a little too close to a nest. Really? Is that So so Jordan, when when we were back in Washington, was walking between our house and her kind of mother-in-law place. And as she was walking by the car, an owl came straight by her head and smashed straight into the window of a car. Oh, my gosh. And fell down and shook it itself off and then went up in the tree and we were trying to figure out what it was but it was probably because it sat in the tree forever it's probably because there was a nest around there Uh it's it's the only logical reason and maybe he misjudged or didn't know that the reflection of the of the glass or something yeah saw trees in the reflection yeah uh, decal of a mouse on the windshield exactly or maybe he was trying to protect her i don't know hard to say but yeah we're coming back now can you ask coming on back mike is hot while we're back, I'm going to let this guy talk. David and Scott Minow are here to answer your bird feeding and nature questions. Now, here are David and Scott on News Talk 710 KNUS. There's a and cue. Now we're back, and uh, we're back with David and Dean and Scott today. We've got uh, Dean Seifert with us today, and Dean and Tina are the new owners 
of the Arvada store. They also own the Denver store, which they bought from Scott oh, close to two three years, years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, two that years ago, July. To three. Okay, two in July. And no, one then, more year, and I can open a new store. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do a fly fishing shop this time, shall we? Yeah, and yeah then, we can uh, do that. So, Dean the inventory Tina. is horrible on those. <laughs> yeah. Dean and Tina also own the Highlands Ranch store, right. the beautiful new Highlands Ranch store at County Line and University. And if you haven't been in there yet, you need to stop in there. It's a great store. But uh, we're we're so happy to have you with us today, Dean. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. So how are you finding your experience with Wild Birds Unlimited at it's, this point? It, it's really been fantastic. It, it, Scott said at the top of the show, we've kind of brought our entire family into it. Uh, so our, our daughter works at the Highlands Ranch store and manages that on a day-to-day basis. And our, our oldest son, Cameron, helps across all the stores. He's, he helps with the technical stuff. In fact, yesterday we were doing a lot of setup things after, after we closed uh, the previous day. And so he's actually taking the day off because yesterday was a little bit stressful. So we were getting everything uh, kind of converted. So it's nice to be able to work with the family and, uh, everybody's having a lot of fun with it. And, uh, appreciate your guys' support. Uh, obviously you have so much, I mean, 60 plus years of, Wild Birds experience. That's uh, the franchise. I know is going to miss that. We're going to miss that, and I know your customers are going to miss that too. But so we're we, not dead yet. I know we're still they, around. I'd say with I'd say I, <laughs> you guys have I, I have big shoes to fill, but I don't know if anyone's seen you in person. <laughs> yeah, really. say that. <laughs> but no, it's been fantastic. So you we're, think we're our really shoes would be cheaper? You know, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, we were talking to but your your youngest son. He he came up with some lousy excuse about being in college or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Well, he. They, I guess he likes the checks that come come his way to pay the tuition. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was interesting the other night. Uh, you and Tina and Kathy and I went out to dinner, and we were talking about Cameron, your son, and uh, he he's very focused. He's a very uh, tech savvy individual, and he was saying, you know, I really want to take care of the tech in these stores, and I'm not really, you know. I, I'm not comfortable waiting on customers, and now you can't keep them off the floor because of the quality of our customers. They're all just such yes. wonderful, friendly people. Yeah, it's a lot it's, of fun. It's a pleasure to work with everybody who comes in the store. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we were in the Denver store the other day, and and he had, for whatever reason, he he was out on the floor doing something, and someone asked him a question, and so he ended up selling him a an APS pole system and a feeder. Basically, got them completely kitted out. <laughs> And the customer came back the next day, and they're like, hey, where's Cameron at? And so Cameron came over from the other office that he was at and came out and helped the customer because they wanted to buy something mm-hmm. else. And so, yeah, I, I think we're probably going to have to get him some branded gear here pretty quickly <laughs> if he's going to wander around the sales That's floor. It. But no, it's You're right. The customers that come in, everybody's super happy to be here, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's a hobby that people can really kind of get into and enjoy. Whether you spend a little bit of money or no money at all or, yeah. you know, kit out the entire yard or whatever, you can... You can kind of take it to whatever level you want, and I think that's the best part of it. Well, everything can be customized for the customer. and What their desires are, the size of the yards, uh, how how much they want to get into it. And it, it's the best hobby because uh, you can enjoy it at any level of knowledge. Right. But when you want to move, if you want to move to the next level of knowledge, you can never learn everything about it. We learn things from the customers that come in all the time. Yeah. You know, birds that are showing up. Uh, we had uh, calls about town- towns and solitaires last week mm-hmm. because all of a sudden they'll start showing up and people can't figure out what they are. They'll come into the store and ask, and That's right. we have the answer for them. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great. So I've got some learning to do to try to to try to replace all the knowledge you guys have, but it'll be a good challenge. Oh, you'll be there in about thirty years. So yeah. Just hang in there. Yeah. Like he said, sixty. Yeah, sixty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, you know, and and the fun thing is, you never know it all. I mean, I'm still learning every day with every interchange. Practically, you pick up something new and different, and that's the wonderful thing about this hobby. You're always learning. You're always expanding your level of knowledge. Uh, you, our customers bring us new information that we didn't have before we're able to impart our information to them and uh, and it really is a different retail environment i don't think people understand uh what the the difference is in a store like this but it's just a, a place where people come and they share their passion and you get to to share that they come in with their stories of beauty and you know it's really just a wonderful way to uh, to spend your time is to uh, to be a birder Plus, things are changing even in our environment, right? We're already starting to, we, we always see new birds coming into the area. 
even in the last several years, people have started to spot more cardinals and so on. That's right. uh, and I think there are a couple other species that you know, every year there's a handful more of species that seem to kind of migrate into the area. That's true. And we live in such a rich environment for, for bird species, so it's it's really a great place to be if you want to get into this. Oh, the variety of habitats in Colorado is remarkable. From the plains to the mountains, you've got a variety of habitats for all sorts of different species of birds. Yeah. If you'd like to join us, 303-696-1971, we're going to go out to the phones and talk with Bernadette from Parker. Hello, Bernadette. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the last uh, sale. I stocked up on a whole bunch of cylinders and suet, and my birds are just having a good time. Excellent. I have a question. Well, we have an answer. You, Let's see if they match. Can. You, you need to impart me with some knowledge that I don't have. All right. <laughs> okay. I have a wooden bird house, and last week Mama Downey came by, and she was pecking on it like crazy. And she kept putting her head through to see if her body was going to make it. Can I go ahead and help her out and make that hole bigger? You think she'll come back and nest there? You know, it depends on the size of the house. For a okay. downy, you want to have a floor size that's about 4 by 4 the height of the entrance above the floor should be about at least 8 inches. And then you uh -huh. can go with a 1.5 inch hole. And that okay. will be sufficient for a downy. So if it's a smaller house, like a wren house with a smaller hole, probably not going to be too effective. If you make that hole larger, you may get sparrows, but you're not going to get a downy. It, it has to be a nice tall house. And if the downy is working away at the hole, that hole, it'll know exactly what size of hole it needs. And, you know, I kind of wonder if they actually have to do that kind of thing as part of getting ready either for a roosting site in the winter or for a nesting site in the spring. Well, and the other thing is, due to the fact that our day length is becoming shorter, this is a time mm -hmm. that birds become confused. Uh, when that day length hits a certain point, it stimulates activity in the pineal glands, and it can tell them that, hey, it's nesting time, but it's kind of a cruel trick at this yeah. time of year because they're getting all warmed up, and all of a sudden it's, oh, nuts. <laughs> yeah. We're just going into winter. We're not going into nesting time. But uh, So that can be part of it, too. A lot of the drumming that we'll hear now, a lot of that uh, nest behavior is very short-term as our days get shorter and shorter. Okay. Yeah, I, I've noticed that, with, uh, especially with my squirrels, um, because it you know, gets darker earlier. Uh -huh. they, they feed all day, and they leave about 4 o'clock, and they don't come back again, mm. yeah. even yeah. though it's still light. They're hitting the bars. In the evening. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I. Well, every Sunday I tell them they're going. They're going to watch the Broncos. That's right. <laughs> and when they're late in the morning, I tell them, well, they haven't been. You know, they haven't gotten back from church yet. <laughs> That's right. Very cool. Well, yeah. They. They. They're very accommodating. Yep. As you well know. Absolutely. But I do thank you for everything, and I love the show. And you know, you know how I am. I'll call you every once in a while, ask a question, and give you some reports. Well, you always make it more enjoyable for us. We appreciate it, Bernadette. Oh, thank you so very much. Well, the, the show is just lovely. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Bernadette. And if you'd like to join us, we're at 303-696-1971 on now, Facebook. Kathy have, has a question. Kathy has a question, yes. Hello, Bird Talk guys. Thank you for all the years of teaching us about birding. Question. Can you tell what kind of owl it is by its hoot? I love learning my leaving. leaving my bedroom window open at night and hearing them quite frequently. I've been assuming this one is a great a horned owl, owl great yeah. horned owl. And uh you know for a lot of different owl calls you can compare if you go to all about birds.org you can type in the name of an owl or just owls and it'll bring up a bunch of owls that you can listen to not all owls hoot as a matter of fact very few owls actually hoot now this is a great horned and that's a female great horn the male great horns hoot is higher in pitch than the female and they will frequently duet back and forth and you'll hear this a lot in December as we get closer to winter you'll hear a lot of this 
duetting back and forth because they're they're breeding in the winter time. They, yeah, they start to court in December, so uh-huh. in end of November, so you can hear that. And it, there's a mnemonic for the great horned owl. Who's awake? Me too. Yeah. And often you can hear a duet, one close, one farther away. Sure. You are listening to the Bird Talk Guys, Scott, David, and Dean on 710 KNUS 990 KRKS. We're going to take a break here and be right back. 303-696-1971. I actually heard that conversation a couple nights ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. So right now they start doing it as territorial feeding behavior, and then when we get into December, they'll do it as breeding behavior. Yeah, oh, really? Behavior. Okay. Yeah. And it's exactly as you said. I heard one right on the roof on top of us, and then I hear another one call from Down probably the, the tree line. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, this are is they nocturnal, or do they come out during the day? They're both. They're mostly nocturnal, but they can be diurnal as well. Yeah. They yeah. digest during the day. There, there are, can they be polyurnal? <laughs> I don't know. About that. <laughs> um, the uh, the interesting thing about owls is the color of their corneas. Uh, iris. Iris is yeah. typically what determines their their diurnal or nocturnal behavior. If they have yellow eyes, they're more diurnal. If they have black eyes, they're more nocturnal. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I would have thought it would have been the other way, so that <coughs> lighter eyes would allow more light in. You would have been wrong. And a, yeah. The first time ever in recorded history. <laughs> but because uh, it would be the size of the opening of the iris, yeah. not just the color. The color of it. Yeah. So, who knows? The dark eye, maybe that's all opening. It could be, yeah. Uh, oh. could be a larger... Uh, oh, that would make sense. Especially if, you know, you shine a flashlight on them and they go like this, then you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're always coming back from the optimo- uh, optometrist, so... <laughs> that's right. But I'm not sure how, how, how constant that is, because, I mean, when we saw the elf owls down in... Uh, uh, Arizona, Arizona, Santa Rita Lodge. Yeah, yeah. down in Madera Canyon, they had... Uh, Yellow eyes. Yeah. But they were exclusively nocturnal. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe they didn't read the books. Yeah. Now, here we go, folks. Okay. Talk. News Talk 7 times. Keep your mic's house. Well, welcome back to Bird Talk. You are listening to Scott and David and Dean on 710 KNUS, 990 KRKS. The Wild Birds Unlimited stores sponsor Bird Talk, so when you stop by the stores in Denver, Arvada, and Highlands Ranch, be sure that you thank them for sponsoring Bird Talk. The Denver store at 2720 South Wadsworth at West JL Avenue. Arvada, where we are today, 7370 West 88th at Wadsworth. And in Highlands Ranch, 1970 East County Line Road at University. So we've got you surrounded. You can stop in and take care of your birds. You know, over, over all the years that we've been serving customers in the Denver metro area, it, it's been amazing to not only watch people get excited about bird feeding, but seeing the experience they had and the ways that they could introduce foods to birds in their yard that maybe the birds hadn't seen before. And all of a sudden, the birds try it out. They tell their friends, and we end up uh, really having a lot of fun talking with the customers over the years. Yeah, when we started 30 years ago, Birds didn't feed on suet very well. No. We didn't sell a lot of it, but they learn. They learn by what we do. And as we started selling a whole lot more suet, and uh, uh, lots of other folks did too, the birds are coming to suet like yeah. crazy. And, we uh, knew that the birds were going after it because we knew that people weren't buying suet just to own it. Right. Yeah. 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 Although. See if it goes up in price. You know, it's great but, for uh, getting a stuck drawer moving again. You just. Rub a little suet on that. You know, we are we're in the middle of a lot of inflation right now, and one of the ways to fight that is to join the Daily Savings Club. Capital idea. That's it, because you can save fifteen percent, which is about double what inflation is right now. Yeah, close to what food is, but uh, you can save fifteen percent anytime you come to the store to buy your bird food. You also get an additional. 
5%, essentially because you earn bird bucks points. No kidding. Every $200, you get a, you get a point. You can save up the, the uh, bird bucks, and you can spend it on anything in a store. So you earn bird bucks on anything, spend it on anything in a store, and for the bird food, you get 15% off every time you come in. So yeah, you average, can join, average. you can experience uh, the uh, great savings on bird food products yeah. and bird products in the stores. Yeah, average savings per customer on that is about 120 bucks a year. So uh, yeah. that's pretty dang good. That's right. You yeah. should join. Plus you get a free gift every time you sign up. So that's it's right. always nice to get something free. Oh, After yeah. we, yeah, that's the best kind of a gift. That's it. After we answered uh, Kathy's question, if you'd like to join us, 303-696-1970. But Kathy on uh, Facebook Live has said thank you because we answered her question about the owls. I'll go to all about birds and lesson in, but from what you just played, I believe they are probably great horned owls. Yeah. I can hear the other one responding way off in the distance. Now I listen to see if I can tell what happens, if it happens to be the female or the male closest to the house. And, of course, the, the Doppler effect may interfere with that because the distance can change the the tone Especially of the if call. they're going by so, you while they're doing that it. too. Yeah. But if you stand in the middle of the two of them, maybe you can tell the difference that way. But isn't it great when we tell somebody something and it turns out to be true? How yeah, often does that happen? Not very. Yeah. Uh, Another uh, comment from Jill was uh, Hi, the three musketeers were Porthos, Athos, and Aramis. D'Artagnan was the trainee. He was. I yeah. hope he's. Learned, though. I yeah. hope he's not still. Training. He was a little bit rash. He was kind of a hothead. I, uh, I guess he so. hadn't learned the maturity of the other musketeers, um, which were not. I mean, the way they would drink and fight. I'm not sure how mature they were. Even well, you know, you. But learn, they're French. You learn how to drink better and fight better. They were as you get older. Yeah, I always have. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so good to have Dean with us today. Dean and Tina are the new owners of the Arvada store, and we invite you to come in and uh, meet them. And I, I'm really excited about seeing what they're going to do at the Arvada store. I know they're going to take it to new levels that have never been reached before, so that's kind of fun. Second floor? Yeah, we're going to yeah, put build, in a, Building a new floor, yeah. I yeah, thought it was yeah. a basement. I <laughs> that's a, that is yeah. a new level. <laughs> No, we should, we should have some fun with it. You were talking about suet uh, a minute ago, and I know one of the most common things that happen when people come in and buy suet for the first time is they'll put it out in their yard for the first time, and it takes a little while for the birds to recognize that that is food. How long does that usually take, do you think, for, for you birds know, to figure that, that out? That can vary greatly, and it depends on the bird's experience with other feeding stations in the area. Uh, it also is uh, seasonal because uh, suet essentially is an insect substitute. Insects are high in fat, suet is fat, so insect eating birds are the ones that come into suet. If there are a lot of insects around, it can take longer. Thankfully, wild birds and limited suets have been rendered so they can stay out there all summer and they don't go bad. Where if you just put sometimes lower quality suets right. or you just put meat fat out there, it starts to smell after a while if it's been warm. So so the Wild Birds Unlimited suets do last longer, but it can take a while for birds to get used to it. Of course, having a suet feeder, the first feeder is not recommended. You want to have a seed type feeder right. that has a uh, bird food in it, like the no mess blend, that's going to attract a great variety of birds at first. Other birds, suet eaters, and other birds will see the activity, and then they'll discover other feeders that way. So yeah, it can take several seasons to have a bird find a suet feeder in the first place. Other people have called us in 20 minutes yeah. after they've left and said, we have birds on our suet feeder, and we tell them they have to scare those away because they haven't paid their dues yet. <laughs> that's right. They haven't takes, paid rent yet. That's but, right. But do you put the suet feeder next to the bird seed feeder? Should it be close? Should it, it be far away? It depends on your viewing area. Yeah. If uh, if you only have a limited viewing area, you can have a, a double crook pole, and you could have the, rig the tube-type feeder or hopper feeder on one side, suet feeder on the other side. Now, this is the best time to start feeding suet or bark butter or any of those high-fat foods because as it gets cooler overnight, as it is cooler in the mornings, right. we've got fewer insects and we've got more birds looking for high-fat foods. So right now, they're looking for more food sources 
because they are the ant, not the grasshopper. They're trying to prepare for winter right now. So they're going to look for foods right now that are new foods and more likely to attract birds to a new food. This is the time to try out new foods. Yeah, you want to take an inventory of your yard right now and... and this is the time to prepare for winter. Think about, uh, well, you know, I've got that bird bath out in the corner, but it's going to be easier to fill it if it's a little closer in. I may move that a little closer. I want to make sure that, you know, if I'm going to put out my deck railing feeders for the winter time, this would be a good time to add that. I won't have to necessarily wade through the snow to fill those, so sometimes it's fun to use those seasonally as well. Uh, but, yeah, you're going to change from your warm weather suets, and there are two kinds of suets. There's a warm weather suet that doesn't melt, and then there's our winter suet, which is higher in fat, and it can melt at around 75 degrees, 80 degrees. In so we, sun, yeah. we switch to that in September, October, and so we're going to regular suets now. Uh, but uh, I, I, I had a customer come in once, and they said, this suet feeder you sold me doesn't work. I don't want it. And I said, okay, I understand. We're happy to give you a full refund. But let me tell you about suet. It can take a while. You can put it out there and just wait and wait. And I remember when I started with suet, it took a while. But the first time I saw that little downy woodpecker hopping down the branch, filling his beak, and hopping back over to the female and feeding her as part of their pairing behavior, for me it was worth the wait. And these birds don't do things on our schedule. So what we're doing is we're planting seeds for the future. Everything we do to design our yards for the birds pays off in the future. And uh, so, yeah, after uh, after as many... Well, Kathy and I moved into our place about seven years ago, and we had Orioles nonstop from May 1st through just about a month ago. And that's because we built the yard that way. Yeah. So it pays off in the future. It can take patience and persistence, whether you're introducing a new feeder to birds or you're trying to attract hummingbirds for the first time. Patience and persistence are can be rewarded. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of hummingbirds, we actually still saw one uh, Is that just a right? few days ago. Is that right? Yard. Would have thought that they would have all moved on by now, but uh, still a couple stragglers. Yeah. And of course, yeah. you're going to leave your hummingbird feeder up for two weeks after you see the last hummingbird. We usually say, keep it up till the end of September. That's right. Which was yesterday. Yeah. And, or if you still are seeing them, two weeks beyond the last one that you see. That's right. Yeah, good policy. Yeah, yeah. You, you noted about winterizing. Uh, one thing that we've talked to a lot of customers about now is going to a heated bird bath. Yeah, much more convenient, easier to keep things straight. Those bird baths are very well built. Um, we've got one in the front yard, one in the backyard. Now you do have to run a cord to it, mm-hmm. um, but uh, aside from that, they're completely, uh, you know, very low maintenance and they're very, they're very effective at what they do. And, and they do keep the birds coming. All they're perfectly all designed for year-round use. You just unplug it, right. reel up the cord for warmer times. Yeah, they're thermostatically controlled, so they're very energy efficient. They only come on when they're needed, and then as soon as they have the water at a temperature where it's not going to freeze, they turn themselves off again, and uh, we we carry the best ones. We just don't mess with less. Uh, all of our products are going to be the top quality, because birds are creatures of habit, and if you have to keep changing things because they break or they don't work, Birds start all over again every time you change something out there. So it's a it's a great idea to look for the best value in products. And that's not always the cheap. As a matter of fact, it's rarely the cheapest thing. The best value is something that's going to perform the way you want it to for the greatest amount of time. And that's a good point there because, uh, Dean, it was what, an excellent what happens, point is what it was. What <laughs> happens with Wild Birds Unlimited tube-type feeders or recycled uh, plastic hopper style feeders if there's a problem with it if it breaks if 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 it needs something what happens with those feeders yeah for us you just bring it back into the store and most of the time we'll have the parts to repair it or fix it or it'll be covered under a warranty of some type uh, so that lifetime guarantee yeah so a amazing lot of, a lot of our customers appreciate be. that because they'll bring something in and um, you know there are certain exceptions, certain things that aren't covered, but sure. uh, for the for the vast majority of things, uh, and many of our products, they do have lifetime guarantees on them. So. And, and we will have the parts if they need a replacement part. Yeah, yeah. most Be of the time we can them. fix it right away. Yep. That's it. You bet. 
So uh, we want to thank you for joining us for this action-packed adventure. I was on the edge of, of my seat. Talk. Yes. I noticed that it it makes you look taller when you do that. Uh-huh. And uh, we. I, uh, we didn't even get to talk about the bird of the month. I'm so disappointed. What is it? It's the bush tit. Yes, yes. very good. Yeah. And they are so much fun to watch. We'll talk about those in the future because this is just the first day of the month. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. All they right. don't. We don't want them to feel left out. That's right. No. We'll cover it next week. I guess. You bet. So uh, thank you for joining us. We'll be back uh, next Saturday from noon to 1 on 710 KNUS, 990 KRKS, com. Until next week, we'd like to say happy, happy birding. birding. Beautiful. Thanks, Thanks Blake. Blake. Colorado. Thank you, fellas. You're the best, man. Next Thanks, Blake. Week. And have a good weekend. You All too, right, you too. Thanks, Facebook friends. We'll see you next week.